Uh, Tom English is with us this morning. Tom, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm very well. Um, I presume that we'll be getting to the stadium an hour earlier than we should be this time. Well, I think it might be an idea if they set off a little bit earlier than they, uh, than they set off the last time. I, I could tell you something behind the scenes. The Scottish rugby union guys were having none of this, uh, the bus with delayed nonsense a couple of years ago. Yeah, and rightly so. It, it was like the, the worst case of deflection you've ever seen because Scotland were brilliant that day and Ireland were just really poor. They, they were, yeah, and um, Vern Cotter was the Scotland coach back then, and he, even though himself and Joe Schmidt are big pals, um, he took a pretty dim view of what he thought was Ireland uh, talking down uh, a terrific win for Scotland, and that kind of resurfaced again during the week, didn't it, with Tyke Furlong, was put in an awkward position, and he looked pretty awkward in dealing with that question, but... I think uh, I think everyone in Ireland should forget that Joe Schmidt ever mentioned anything about a bus two years ago. Yeah, because the, the thing is that one of the... Just having a bit of trouble with that Skype there. I guess the, the thing is, Tom, there had been such a, maybe a decade-long period where the Irish provinces were so dominant against the Scottish teams that we came as a matter of course to expect victory against Scotland. And to be fair, the international team would generally, with occasional... Um, and the, the uh, Triple Crown denying victory at Croke Park definitely um, sticks in the memory. But there were very few windows where Scotland actually were showing any signs of progress. Their whole system seemed to be broken. Our system was great. Ergo, we were the superpower, and they were just a, an annoyance along the way, a speed bump. Since then, they've got really good. Yeah, I mean, Scotland, Scotland have won, I think, the last two of the last three at Murrayfield against Ireland. And Ireland are, I mean, Ireland are the model for, for Scotland in, in many ways. You know, back in the 90s, Ireland were, were behind Scotland. But since professionalism came in, Scotland has fallen miles behind Ireland. And um, it's, been a, it's been a major problem. But over the last three or four years, things have improved an awful lot in Scotland. There is hope at the end of the tunnel now under Vern Cotter and under Gregor Townsend. It's, um, it's, it's say the gap has narrowed a little bit, but Ireland's still under there, obviously a, a lot better than, than Scotland there. When Ireland got drawn in Scotland's pool in the World Cup, it seemed that Irish rugby fans were fairly happy with that, with Scotland and with Japan. I wonder if Scottish rugby fans were happy that Ireland were the top seed that they got. Um, they weren't displeased. Um, but listen, everyone, everyone in Scotland knows how good Ireland are. I mean, they've had multiple pummelings uh, in recent times uh, against, against Ireland, mostly in Dublin, not so much in, in, in Scotland. Uh, so, I mean, they look. They would look then, and certainly it's been reinforced now that Ireland are one of the top teams in the world. So there's, there's, uh, there's no, um, there was no rejoicing, put it that way, when, uh, when Ireland came out of the hat with Scotland. It's, it's a rivalry that's developed, isn't it? I mean, that's just, it's not just uh, the Joe Schmidt bus gate. There's been a number of things. Scotland not voting for Ireland in the world for the World Cup bid. There's a lot of animosity between Glasgow and Munster in recent years in the Pro 14. So there's a lot of things that have been going on. You speak to a lot of Scottish players here and they feel that the Irish media have, haven't exactly been uh, overly um, fair to them um, in recent times. So there is an edge underneath the surface. Are they right? Do they have a point? I mean, have the Irish media largely been ignoring the improvements in Scottish rugby? I, I think, I think oh, probably over-egging it a little bit. Um, but there would be a couple of people who'd be who'd be saying a few uh, uh, fairly um, unfair things. Um, like Scotland have come, we have to remember, Scotland have come from the most desperately dark place. Uh, I moved to Scotland in 2005 and there was no hope here. People were still, you know, rugby people, salt of the earth rugby people, were still talking in 2005 about... Scotland abandoning professionalism and just going back to the amateur structure because things were so hopelessly bad. Um, things are an awful lot better now. Vern Cotter it kind of instigated the turnaround. Gregor Townsend has, has carried that on. Scotland at home are a dangerous beast. If this game was in Dublin, I would say it's, it, it's pretty much not quite a formality, but it should, Ireland should easily win. But because it's in Murrayfield and... Scotland's record there is, is exceptional in recent times. It's a dangerous one for Ireland. Yeah. The other thing that Scotland have done since that turnaround is that they play brilliant rugby. They're great to watch. They have attacking flair 
And rather than stifle that attacking flair and try and play a possession game or a rooking game or whatever the hell, it's like, well, let's get the ball in the hands of our most creative thinkers and give them the freedom to make mistakes. Yeah, I mean, look, I didn't fall in love with rugby and nobody, I think, fell in love with rugby because of, of the bludgeon uh, and the hits uh, and the intensity and the attrition and all these buzzwords that we get nowadays. We fell in rugby because of the flair. Uh, the French flair, the Welsh flair, if you're old enough to remember it. You two are clearly aren't, I am. Um, it's, um, and, and, and Scotland kind of represent that. They are a, a, a kind of like a throwback. They want to um, play the rapier style of rugby. They, they want to cut you open, not just batter your brains out. Now, that's, that's uh, I'm sure, not by choice. It's by necessity because they don't have the brutes in the back row and in the second row to play that type of game eff- effectively. They can, with if, if they had John Barkley and Hamish Watson in the pack, they would they would uh, they would do a pretty good version of it. But they don't, so they have to compensate by playing this. What Gregor Townsend said when he came into the job that he wanted to play the fastest brand of rugby in the world. And, yeah. and like we have seen elements of that, haven't we, in terms of the, the flair that Scotland have brought to the pitch. And one player who stuck out last weekend, surely, was uh, Blair Kinghorn. Is, is he set to have a, a Jacob Stockdale-type season? Um, I'm really not sure, because I'm not sure Blair Con- Kinghorn is going to start on Saturday. Right. Um, Sean Maitland sounds like he's going to be fit. The team is going to be named at 2 o'clock today. Um, that would put Seymour and Maitland as the starting wings with Kinghorn on the bench. I might have got that wrong, but Maitland um, certainly deserves his place in the team. Um, Seymour's in decent form as well for Glasgow. Scotland's problem last week in the last 15 minutes against Italy, when they conceded three tries, was that the bench was really poor. Very inexperienced bench. Players coming on the pitch who are not playing regularly for their clubs. So Townsend's big job this week was to get the cavalry out of the treatment room and into his 23. And I think he's bringing three or four new players back into the squad now. And what was the the true reflection of where Scotland are at the moment? Was it that first 40, 45, 50 minutes where they were brilliant? I mean, did they just rest on their laurels a little bit against Italy, which would be fairly natural if you're 30 points up? Um, I, I'm not sure. I think that would be that would be pretty easy, easy uh, opt-out. Um, I think it just showed that they were missing from the from what I would consider their best twenty three. They were missing eight of them against Italy. Um, they're going to get three or four of them back this week, and so when they so when they come on, so when Jake Kerr comes on at hooker, Jake Kerr making his debut, Fraser Brown is missing. Uh, when Adam Hastings is coming on to play ten, um, you're missing someone like Pete Horn. You're missing Johnny Gray off the bench. Um, you're missing big, big players coming off the bench. And I think that's why Italy took advantage. Because uh, uh, Scotland's depth, when you're with, missing eight of your 23, the guys underneath that, they're just not good enough at this level. Yeah. The other thing we've been talking about the whole way through this is that um, Ireland are perennially slow starters into the tournament. And uh, they got a punch in the mouth last week. So it'll be interesting to see how they bounce back. But for Scotland, there is the the sense of confidence. and whatever that confidence engenders in the group. And, you know, it definitely feels like they're, they feel like they're part of a movement at the moment with a coach who believes in them and their skill set and who isn't talking them down. All the, all the, it just seems like all the materials are there for them to be able to beat Ireland this weekend. Well, well cer- certainly at Murrayfield. You know, when you look at their record, since, since the last World Cup, they've played 16 games at Murrayfield. <clears throat> they've won 12. They've lost four. The four teams that have turned them over... South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, and England, and by a maximum of six points. So nobody has beaten them by more than six points at Murrayfield since since the, since the last World Cup. Now you look at Ireland. Ireland put them away handily in Dublin, but they don't do it in Murrayfield. Murrayfield is, is has become a bit of a cauldron for them. I'm not saying Scotland are going to win, but I think they are a different animal at Murrayfield. They're vulnerable on the road, as we could see in Ireland, as we could see in Wales. We saw it at Twickenham season, a couple of seasons ago when it conceded 60. We saw it on the road when they lost to Fiji. They lost to America in the summer. But bring them back to Edinburgh, and they are, they are a very formidable side with that crowd in the, uh, behind them. 
Yeah, and yet Ireland are still fairly heavy favourites for this. Seven points favourites. That seems mad yeah. to me. Well, why, why not? I mean, look at what Ireland have done. Um, Ireland have shown that they can go on the road and win and win big games. Scotland, Scotland are on paper. Scotland are an inferior team to Ireland, so I'm not surprised that Ireland are favourites. I think I think seven points is is fair enough. Um, but it's this is a trappy one for Ireland. You know, I know Ireland will come over here and they'll they'll be all guns blazing because what happened to them in in Twickenham and uh, are in I guess England and and. And Scotland are expecting that, expecting the most humongous backlash. But this is um, this is this is da- this is a da- this is a dangerous one for them. You know, it really is. I know you were saying that um, the Scots weren't doing handstands whenever uh, Ireland were drawn against them, but it's kind of the perfect draw for Scotland. In, in you know, looking at it objectively and, and without that kind of sense of oh yeah, okay, here, here's a team who've beaten us a lot. Uh, you know, a game uh, not not at Murrayfield, but also not at TV events. So therefore probably swings a little bit more towards Scotland than it does to Ireland um, in Japan. And Ireland with their, you know, psychological barrier at every World Cup. If I was Townsend, I'd be starting to talk about that game now. Ah, no, listen, Towns- Townsend won't talk about the France game in a couple of weeks' time, not to mind uh, Japan in, in a number of months. I promise you that. He has a very singular focus on the next game and the next game and the next game. Um, but he'll get round to that. He's not one to play mind games, nor is Joe Schmidt. Obviously, leave that to Eddie Jones, um, because you know, listen, if he, if he starts to play mind games with Ireland, it can it can it can come back and bite him on the backside, and he knows that all too well. Ireland have the Ireland have the capacity to win this game very well. They do. Um, but what's intriguing is that Scotland have the capacity to win it as well. Their chances are 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 reduced by the fact that they're missing their two best back row forwards. John Barkley injured, Hamish Watson injured. They're their two wreckers in chief. Barkley is an absolute pest at the breakdown, as is Watson. Um, you put those two into the back row, you'd almost you'd always make it level pegging. But they are missing and Scotland will miss them. I did want to ask one thing about um, the standing of Townsend. Um, within the Scottish rugby community. Um, there was definitely a sense for a long period of time that uh, unless you were Ian McGeekin, then you had to be a foreigner within Scottish rugby to be properly respected and to get the support of everybody and to be able to unite clans. Um, has Townsend managed to get over that post-colonial inferiority complex? Well, I mean, I mean you talk about foreigners. Um, yeah, Scotland have had a, a few uh, foreign coaches, but... Um, Vern Cotter would be uh, uh, respected throughout Scotland for what he did. Uh, if you go back to a previous foreign coach, Matt Williams, um, I don't want to be disrespectful, but uh, he wouldn't have the same aura in Scotland as Vern Cotter has. Um, so I don't think I think everyone thought it was it was the right time. A lot of people bemoan the, the fact that Cotter uh, was moved on um, because I think if they, they have it, they're in a dilemma. The SRU, they knew that if they committed, recommitted to Vern Cotter, who was doing a great job, that Gregor Townsend in all probability would be lost to Scottish rugby. He would have gone to England or he'd have gone to France as a, in a club job. And he might not come back. So they were they were kind of not forced into appointing him, but it's just circumstances uh, made it the, the right decision. And now he's been... What, what, what pe- Scottish people love about Townsend is the way his team plays. Yeah. And it's not, they're not, not that they're accepting of failure, but they like what they see. They're, they're being excited. They're getting off their seats. They're seeing these tries that, that appeal to the Scottish psyche, the, 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 the you know, the alan, the gallusness is a Scottish word, that they, that they, they, they love that flair. And, and that's, that's going down, that's going down a storm at, uh, at Murrayfield, I can tell you. Yeah, I can see why. Will you give us a prediction for the game? Um, oh gosh, that's a horror. That's a horrible question. Um, <laughs> I think Ireland by six. Nice one, Tom. Enjoy it. Thanks a million. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks, lad. Tom English giving us uh, some thoughts there on the game of the weekend. So, according to the bookies, we are more likely to beat England than we are to beat Scotland. Yeah. This is probably a home and away thing. Of course, yeah. there is. Yeah.